But one of the things I learned was, you know, you should be writing from a point of passion. You should be writing uh, things that you enjoy to read. And if you expect to, to write in that genre, you should read deeply in that genre. But growing up, I was not sort of limited to one genre. I mean, if you look at my library here, I've got a big science fiction section, a big fantasy section, a big thriller section, a big mystery section, a big uh, uh, horror section. And because I love reading all of that. And so when it came to starting to write, uh, my writing is sort of an amalgam of, of these different genres. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks Do, where we're doing something different for our first interview of the year. Our guest today is James Rollins, who is moving outside the genre that I typically know him for, writing thrillers, with a new book, which is in the fantasy genre called The Starless Crown. Austin Rue, who typically is behind the camera and behind the scenes as our producer, is stepping in front of the camera today to host this program, as fantasy is one of his favorite genres, and he's far more schooled in it than I am. So, Austin, I turn the program over to you to introduce James. Thank you for joining us, um, and thanks, Carol. Joining me today is James Rollins. He is a veterinarian and the New York Times bestseller. Um, he's most known for his Sigma Force, an action thriller adventure series, but today he'll be talking about his newest foray into fantasy, The Starless Crown, the first book in the Moonfall series. So, James, could you tell me a bit about the Starless Crown? It's the you know the first book in a in a new world, and I sort of decided to jump into uh, back into fantasy because I had this idea for you know setting a story, and I was debating whether it's going to be a thriller or whether it's going to be a fantasy because I had this idea for you know what if the Earth stopped spinning? So one side was eternally facing the sun, you know, blasted, burnt to a crisp. The other side is in, locked internally in darkness, frozen darkness. You know, air is turned to ice. You know, continents shift, uh, lands are buried under ice or, or burnt up. And so I, I debated it initially whether to make it a thriller and make it a, a contemporary story where this happens or, you know, jump millennia, you know, countless millennia into the future where the landscape is so, so changed that it could almost feel like a fantastical landscape. And I decided that was more exciting because uh, early in my career, I used to write fantasy. I, I was writing fantasies under the uh, pseudonym James Clemens. And for the first you know, basically decade of my career, I was writing a fantasy year and a thriller a year. So, uh, but James Rollins sort of became, uh, you know, pushed James Clemens to the side a little bit. Uh, James Collins, uh, so James Rollins came over to the forefront, but I couldn't quite let go of those fantasy roots. It's when I had this story uh, and I had this concept probably for about seven or eight years ago, but I, I shelved it, figured, you know, I'm, you know, that's, I'm not ready to go back to fantasy yet. Uh, but over time, you know, as my writing, you know, my skills got a little better. I was ready to sort of set a world uh, to return to those fantasy roots a bit. Uh, to bring, you know, what I learned from uh, James Rollins, a thriller writer, and James Clemens, a fantasy writer, and sort of uh, making an amalgam of those two sides of my, my brain, those two sides of my, my writing personality. And so uh, as all stories go, you know, it's great to have a landscape and a map and a world, but it took me a while to figure out, you know, who was going to tell that story. And so I have, you know, post-it notes and scribbled things in journals, you know, constructing the history of these of this land. And eventually I sort of discovered this, this, this girl, a girl named Nix. Uh, it started the story. She's uh, 14 years old. She was orphaned in these swamps, left abandoned. And uh, uh, she's born partially blind. She can see lights and shadows, but not much else. Uh, then at the beginning of the story, there's an attack by sort of a major apex predator of the swamps, this gigantic uh, mere bat. And the poisoning sends her into a sort of a uh, fever dream where she has a prophecy of the moon falling into the and crashing into the earth. Um, and as she wakes from that dream, the poison has also uh, cleared her eyes so now she can see. But uh, the world of, of this land is in the midst of a, of a conflict and no one really wants to hear a prophecy of doom during this period of time. So she's uh, her prophecy is attempted to be squashed. Others also sort of uh, are beginning to get an inkling something's wrong with the moon. And so that begins a great quest to find out, you know, is this prophecy true? And if so, is there a way to stop it? And that becomes the, the big quest of the, the first part of the story. Now, you mentioned that you had thought about this, what, eight years ago, but uh, was this a draft that was sitting in a drawer and waiting to come out? Or was it something that you kind of just had rummage, rummaging in your head for a while? 
that you did that you decided to come back to and finally write? Well, I think any author, you know, they, we always have an, our antenna our antenna up for that that next idea, um, you know. So I, I've got, you know, if you look over here, I've got these uh, silver little cases over there of uh, of basically ideas. There, I used to have them in a big cardboard box. I called my my idea box. I just throw things in there. It was half hazard. It was messy. Uh, and what would happen is, uh, is as I'm sort of sifting through trying to keep that limited to one box, because as you well imagine, throwing bits and tidbits into that over time, uh, you know, one box could become two, two becomes four, and then it's, you know, James Rollins on hoarders. And yeah. we didn't want that to happen. So I, had to, I had to keep calling through it. And, How often do you do uh, that? How often do you go back? It's literally, I'm very scheduled. I'm a little regimented. Maybe that comes from my scientific background, but it's once a month. I go through oh, there. Nice. Okay. I, I sift through something I know that, that are permanently going to be there that I can quickly say, that's, I'm saving. That's a cool idea. I don't know when. Um, right. And a lot of times, it's, you know, historical bits that might become uh, the historical mystery for a Sigma novel, uh, or maybe some scientific question that makes me go, what if, where do I head to? But also I said in this idea was this uh, this germ, the seed of an idea for setting a story based on a tidally locked planet, a planet that circles the sun with one side forever facing it, like our moon does. Our moon is tidally locked around our planet. We only see one side of the moon at, at any time. And so uh, that idea was in there for a long time and I kept adding to it. You know, I had a little folder in there and I kept chucking things in there, you know, drew a very, very rough map. I did a... Uh, took over towards internet site and I showed my original map that I had drawn. It's, it's, it's quite horrendous. <laughs> a very, very nice map maker and illustrator. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sure compared uh, to a cartographer. I'm that into something that uh, does not look like a, a first grader when that's even actually generous. <laughs> a first grader did that. Uh, and so uh, I always, and that's a problem with me as a writer is, you know, that when I was first learning to write, you know, again, veterinary background, I've had no, you know, no formal training in writing. If you read it in my books, you'll go, hey, he's saying no formal training in writing. Wow. Uh, but one of the things I learned was, you know, you should be writing from a point of passion. You should be writing uh, things that you enjoy to read. And if you expect to, to write in that genre, you should read deeply in that genre. But growing up, I was not sort of limited to one genre. I and mean, if you look at my, my library here, I've got a big science fiction section, a big fantasy section, a big thriller section, a big mystery section, a big uh, uh, horror section. And because I love reading all of that. And so when it came to starting to write, uh, my writing is sort of an amalgam of, of these different genres. You know, Sigma Force uh, can be considered almost, uh, you know, scientific fiction speculation of where some of the science is heading to. There are some fantastic elements in the Sigma Force novels. Uh, so again, well, for this thriller, uh, what sort of got me excited was the idea of trying to construct a sort of a scientific fantasy is to make, a, you know, recognize and carry forward the, these you know, standard tropes of what you expect to see in a fantasy novel, the quest, the team. Uh, but also recognizing I didn't want the magic just to be pure magical. I wanted to be a scientific basis behind it. I want everything, the, the creatures that, uh, that you have seen in this that seem fantastical uh, have a evolutionary basis for why they would uh, develop in that type of harsh environmental niche. And so you know, I talked to you know, xenobiologists, astrophysicists, trying to make sure I get all my, my details correct. So to me, that's what's exciting is to try to combine sort of the science fiction and fantasy and, and uh, you know, create something that feels hopefully uh, something fresh, it feels new, but at the same time, you can recognize as being uh, a sort of a standard typical fantasy. Well, and you came from, I read that you came from an evolutionary biology background, um, at least when you were in school, is that something that you, kept going back to and could creatures feature heavily in this book so I do. and again it's you know people often ask me what's my jim what's your favorite book that you've written and oftentimes i will point to uh well i usually say yeah i like all my kids all my books i love but typically if you really if you really you know put me to the thumb screws i'm going to say one of my favorite books that i wrote was amazonia which is a book that takes place in the Amazon jungle. A mutagen gets loose and starts uh, mutating all the jungle animals, sometimes combining two different types of animals into one. And uh, you know, as a veterinarian uh, and a, with a, you know with a uh, BA in evolutionary biology, you know what fun is it to you know, create your own pantheon, bestiary of creatures that are going to you know terrorize my my my. Uh, characters in Amazonia. So this uh, Starless Crown was a, a chance to, uh, to touch back a little bit on that, is to create my own, uh, my own uh, 
you know, bestiary of creatures that are going to inhabit, inhabit this world, but make it also, you know, them to be, feel like they're of, of the environment, not you know, a dragon out of the blue that just happens to appear. You know, if there's a creature right. in the book, there's a reason why they're formed. There's a reason why they fit that niche. And in the book, you'll find there's these sort of schematic uh, drawings that, that uh, a great a great illustrator, Dania Fiddle, would help me with, uh, which I also liked. I like books that have sort of these, uh, you know, get the, a sense that you're reading a, uh, a scientific journal, some, some type of, uh, of uh, uh, naturalist out in the wild that has been sketching. They, were, uh, they almost looked like they were found somewhere, you know, in, in they, some library in, the, uh, in the, the school that Nix goes to maybe. Right, that's what that one's out, you can see, yeah. great. So it was a great deal of fun playing with that. And, and Daniel Filler is great because she, she challenges me when it comes to the creatures even, is that, you know, I'll give her a rough sketch of what th what this creature is, what, what the mirror bat looks like. And then she'll say, well, what if, you know, if they're in this environment, what, what you know, what, what would happen if, you know, if they had a prehensile tail, you know, why wouldn't they have a prehensile tail? So yeah, that's cool, let's do, let's add that. And so there's yeah. some back and forth with her that helped, uh, because uh, she has a naturalist background herself, so she was able to, uh, you know, push me a little bit even further on, on making the, the creatures feel as though they belong to that niche. How much did you bring to her in terms of this is what the creatures do, this is where they fit in the story, or did she have the book ahead of time and could kind of relate to you with that? No, no I... I, I she was constructing the creatures as I was writing the book. So okay. as, I, as I, I, was, I was reaching another creature, I would then give her like the description that's in the book that I use for that. But I also have as, as many, you know, if you do character bios, you know, there's a lot of information that never, that makes the, ends up on the cutting room floor during the process of, of writing a novel. Uh, I don't want to have to have, you know, my readers read an entire, you know, anatomical history and right. uh, detail of this creature or get a little boring. So uh, I have that in, in my own notes and I shared that with, with, with Dania, the, with the artist uh, to help, you know, capture as well as I can, but it's pretty amazing the way, you know, I, I, in my head, I knew what the creature looked like and I, you know, I gave her the sketchy the details and some details that I added for my notes, but it was amazing how once she created it, how, you know, that was like exactly what was in my head. Um, wow, that's great. You know, that, that would become so different that it would affect my my uh, own idea of what that creature looks like you know occasionally I get that question asked you know jim you know sigma's really cool what if it, there was a movie of a sigma force novel you know who would pay who would play gray or monk or cocalis um and uh, I, I don't like playing that game because i'm afraid that if i think too deeply on that concept that i'll begin thinking of that character as that actor you know right now you know i read harry potter before the movies ever come out in my head i know what harry potter looks like but now that I've seen the movies, I cannot escape the fact that Harry Potter looks exactly like Daniel Radcliffe. So, you know, it's, I'm afraid I'll run into that situation. But with, with Daniel, it's amazing the way she was able to literally render what was in my head so beautifully. Yeah, and it's so helpful as you're reading through, because sometimes there were certain creatures that I was like, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I can fill out the body of this in my head. There were some of the like monstrous cats that would attack right. people that I was like, I've never been attacked by a panther, so I can't, like, <laughs> like the image yeah, really brought it out. Um, but you mentioned how, uh, I think in a lot of fantasy, there is this tendency to have a bit too much detail. Uh, uh, there'll be, you know, appendices upon appendices of information about the world and all of that. But, um, in this story, it's very, very action adventure based. I, I felt almost like it followed along with kind of an Indiana Jones sort of story. And so I'm curious about a few things. One of them being, what was it that you learned from thrillers that you were able to bring to the fantasy genre so that it doesn't become slow in the way that Lord of the Rings can kind of, you know, take a couple hundred pages to set off? <laughs> Again, that probably goes to my, you know, my background of what I love to read is, you know, I, 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 you know, grew up reading the old pulp novels from the 30s and 40s. You know, one of the great influences for Sigma Force is uh, the old pulp novels of, of Doc Savage. Uh, he had his own team of uh, sort of scientific uh, and intellectual people that helped him during his adventures. So I, I think I've got a little bit of that uh, pulp nature, you know, ingrained in me a little bit. And uh, so you know, to me, I, I, I like stories that immerse you in the world, but don't 
slow the story down. You know, I, I like stories that have a, a bit of a, of a, a fast pace to them. Yet at the same time, when it comes to, you know, writing fantasy versus a thriller, you know, thrillers are very staccato paced, you know, they're very short chapters, they're very, a lot of dialogue driven, they're, um, uh, there's a lot of white on the pages of a thriller novel, mm -hmm. whereas a fantasy is a little, it's a world building, so it's a little richer, it's a little deeper. So, um, you know, I'm trying to find that happy medium between the two, between not being overindulgent in making my reader read every single fact I've ever thought about this world, and keeping the story and the characters uh, uh, engaging enough that it, it makes you turning the pages late into the night and, and, and hopefully trying to finish that book as well as you can in one sitting. Which it, it's a long book, so it might be harder with this one. But <laughs> that felt <be> a challenge. <laughs> well, one of my thoughts was it's 550 pages. And a lot of your thrillers, uh, um, they're not too much shorter than that, if, if I'm correct. Um, how do you write? these so quickly with such quality the um you know the fantasy the thrillers typically run about 120 to 130,000 words uh this okay. is about 200,000 words so it actually is about twice the long the twice the length of a sigma novel but probably why the pages aren't corresponding to that is that there are more words per page uh for the fantasy novel like I said the staccato thrill staccato paced thrillers have a lot of white on the pages they're they're have a tendency to to not be quite as densely written, whereas this is a little bit more densely written. So there's a lot more words, but maybe not as many uh, more pages. Um, I, forgot, wait, I totally forgot what your question was. <laughs> I am forgetting what it was. Oh, how do you write so quickly? Uh, With such quality. People question that, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm a, a slow writer. You know, back when I was working full-time as a veterinarian, uh, I had to find how writing fit in my, in my schedule. And it took me a while to find that accommodation. Uh, initially, I thought, well, I'm going to write, so, you know, so many words per day, or I'm going to write, you know, X number of hours per day. But I found I, I what worked for me was uh, was the number of pages. I thought, well, you know, I, I tried, you know, what would fit within. I could write a little bit during my lunch hour and a little bit finish at night, so it didn't impede on my life too much. Because you never know if it's going to be published. It's more of a hobby. I just like doing it for fun. And so I thought I'm going to do three pages a day. Then I kept qualifying a little bit. It's going to be three double space pages a day. So that's for the page and a half. And then it was not every day, I'll do five out of seven days of the week. And you know, that's what felt comfortably that I could fit in with my schedule. And I ever thought if I ever get rid of my day job, I'll be much more productive. And of course I am. I write five double space pages a day. I find that's I hit a wall about that period of time because it takes me about an hour for me to write one double space page. So five pages, about five hours of new writing. And the rest of the day is you know editing or going over stuff I've written in the past or uh, doing research, calling somebody up or uh, the business side of writing. So it makes a full day, but five hours is my, my commitment to a, to new writing for that day. And if you do that five out of seven days of the week, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not toiling all hours of the day, every single day. If you write, you know, five pages out of, out of, out of, you know, five days a week, that's 25 pages a week. And uh, you can definitely get, you know, easily two chunky novels done if you stick to that schedule. Yeah, and even just a couple months. Uh, do you outline ahead of time? I have the rough sketch. Like, I know where this story ends. I know how everything resolves in the story. Uh, the the uh, Starless Crown, the Moonfall saga is going to be four books long. I know exactly, you know, where each of those tent poles end for each of those novels. So each book feels, has a sort of a, a climax, a conclusion to that story. Uh, but there's a bigger arc that doesn't finish to the end. Uh, do I know all the details uh, to, for, uh, to get from A to B to C to D? I don't. I don't like to outline too great detail because what I, I found in the past when I've done that, I never stick to it anyways. And it feels a bit of a wasted effort. And it's hard for me in a, in a, in a week, a uh, couple of weeks sitting uh, to construct an outline that is as imaginative if I give myself the full, you know, half a year to come up with all the twists and turns. And so to me, you know, I like finding the characters and finding my story as the story unfolds, because oftentimes the, the characters will, will surprise me, the, the plot will twist in ways I wasn't expecting. And I find, if, again, similar to maybe trying to identify an actor for a character, I'm afraid that if I lock down my plot too tightly, that I, it may constrain me from letting the story take uh, the unexpected turns or the characters do things that are unexpected if they're already locked into that outline. Right. And uh, in this book, especially, there are a ton of set pieces throughout. And I was just thinking, do you have an idea of the set piece that, oh, this will prob there will probably be an airship 
uh, going down at some point in this novel and we're gonna be on the inside of it and <laughs> see how everything falls apart? Or is that something that you're discovering as you go? It's a little bit of both. I mean, I knew there were going to be airships. Because I figured I need to get my characters from point A to point B. And, and being this is going to be a global story, they had to get great distances to be traveled. So I had to figure out, do, do, do I lose the way gates like they do in Wheel, Wheel of Times? Uh, is there some type of magic? But I didn't want to use magic. So I needed to, to make it a, a real reason that they can get quite a distance quite fast. So I need to create some type of uh, vehicle for doing that. So I knew the airships were going to be in that. Uh, do I know the great details of the different uh, classifications of ships or or how things were going to unfold? Do I know a ship was going to crash? Yeah, yeah. You know, me being a thrill, <laughs> like, something's, the ship is going to crash for sure. There's going to be If there's going to be a ship, you have exactly. to make it crash. Exactly. Check off ship. Um, so, <laughs> but, but you mentioned all the characters are in such different parts of the world and they all, I, I guess I don't want to say too much about the story, but for the first part of the story, they're kind of orbiting each other um, and they're pretty distant. So how did you get them to still feel connected even though they were so far away in, in such different locales? Well, again, I, it's, it's probably just my preference. I, I love fiction that has an ensemble cast uh, versus you know the, the, the one hero who solves everything and does everything. Uh, I resisted doing uh, a series like Sigma Force because of that, you know, trying to make one character have to solve all the problems. Um, it's what I call the murder she wrote syndrome is that, you know, Jessica Fletcher from murder she wrote, um, you know, she always stumbles over dead bodies and she always solves the crime. And you begin to question why is she always stumbling over dead bodies? What's what's going on here? Unless the resolution of that series was that she was a serial killer and she's been, you know, framing everybody all along, then it would make sense. I've never stumbled over dead bodies. So I don't know what her problem with, the, you know, Cabot Cove yeah, that they have like dead bodies laying around like that. Extremely unlucky, just a very unlucky person. And it's also, it makes it a challenge uh, just from a standpoint of a fiction for maintaining tension is that if you have a serial character that pairs book after book after book or episode after episode after episode, like in Murder, She Wrote, you know, if somebody puts a gun against Jessica Fletcher's head, you know that trigger's never going to be pulled because she's going to be next week's episode. So it's hard to maintain uh, you know, uh, character jeopardy by having a, uh, that type of thing. But I sort of solved that for Sigma Force by deciding to make it based on a team of characters so that everybody's in jeopardy. Uh, anybody at any point can be knocked off because they can always recruit a new member into Sigma Force. So when it came to writing the fantasy, I, I, again, it, it's, I like the idea of an ensemble cast. I like seeing different peaks of this world because it's hard to get a global perspective of a tidally locked planet if you're if the ever all the characters are in one tiny area so i wanted to get sort of a hint of the breadth of the characters by looking at the fringes of the crown for for just uh, to make it clear the starless crown the crown is the name of the the circlet of twilight lands that are between the you know the here's the sun here's the darkness the the band around here which has a uh, habitable lands is a tech, they call the crown because it's basically like a circlet and so I wanted to see, you know, who's living at those fringes, you know, who's at the fringe here, who's at the fringe here, and then this, the main characters are, are sort of in the middle of the, of the crown, because eventually the story is going to break off, and they're going to venture into those, host those very harsh and hostile lands of the, of the, uh, the frozen wastes and the, uh, the blasted areas. So uh, by having an ensemble cast, it allows me to give a peek of the breadth of that world a little bit more, while also, you know, allowing unusual threads of the story to begin to tie connections that don't seem to be in existence, you know, as the story unfolds, you begin to see threads that start, start to tie these, these, these various factions together. And we become close to them pretty quickly. How did you make sure that each character was sympathetic in their own way? How, how did you do that so fast? Um, again, it, <laughs> Well, it's going to make me sound like a hack when I'm about to describe <laughs> it. Is sure that, I, read a, sure I read a, a screenwriting book and, and it was, they list in there the, the, uh, the seven ways to make your character sympathetic to the, uh, to the audience. And they have, you know, ways to do it like, a, you know, have the character you know, show love or respect for, you know, a pet, uh, somebody elderly, somebody handicapped, somebody with a disability. Uh, have them be good at what they do, uh, have them uh, have other characters love that character. And for mm -hmm. some reason, there's a mirroring effect that you begin to love that character. So there's some, some, some ways to, 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 to build in that, that association. But that's just sort of a, 
the skeleton of what goes on in there. You know, to me, it takes me a while to create these characters. Uh, I have to live with them for a while because I created Nyx probably maybe four or five years ago when I started thinking about her. Okay. And uh, so it takes a while for them to, to build and become what's that, that character in my head. So once they're, they're living in my head for a while, then I'm, I'm ready to ask again why I hate having to try to tie a char- uh, actor to that character because they, they live so much in my head like that. Mm-hmm. So if, if, you know, if I'm finding that I'm drawn to them, I want to find more about them. I want to know more about them. And hopefully the reader is going to feel the same way. Um, and readers have good nose on them. You know, they know uh, if a writer is sort of bored with what they're writing, um, you know, you probably encountered a series that it feels like they're right. The writer is just going through the motions right. or it feels like just repeating themselves. And I'm, I'm it's, it's one of the, the eternal fears that somebody's going to, to, to start saying that about me. Um, so, you know, I try to keep things fresh Whether the Sigma Force series, trying to do very different things with that, with that series or with the fantasy series is just, you know, if, if I'm in love with the characters, hopefully the reader will have a nose to sense, you know, to feel that love that somehow gets transmitted to the, to the reader. Is that how you found each of their voices? Because the, uh, the three main protagonists are very different people. You know, you've got a 14 year old girl and kind of an arrogant prince, arrogant, but lovable. Um, and you've got a thief, Rafe, uh, who just gets into trouble. So different. And yeah, how, how did you find the voice for them? Was it just the simmering of the character in your head of, over time? It's that, but it's also, you know, the character should be a reflection of their setting. You know, no character is, you you grow up with the, and are influenced by everything that's around you. So, you know, Rafe, you know, he was born a thief, uh, not born a thief, but he joined the Thief Guild after his uh, being somewhat orphaned himself. And, uh, you know, it's just, and he's, he's not fully of that land he's uh he's a half breed of that land and so he's feeling slightly distant not a place so it's just you know building that layer by layer of of where they can you know the environment in which they're raised and their their history that allows their voices to come forward uh, were there any characters that you felt like you related to the most uh who would hopefully none most? of the villains <laughs> <laughs> Well, the villains themselves are fun to write because, you know, as an author, you get to put yourself in the, in the shoes, the mindset and do dastardly things you can't really do in real life. Um, but, you know, probably the character that that's, you know, feels mostly is, is Graylin. He's the, the broken knight uh, who bonds to two of these uh, uh, wolf-like uh, Varger uh, beasts out in the wild. And he's, uh, you know, I don't know, for some reason, you know, his affinity for his, uh, for his dogs is the way I feel with like my dogs. So there's some connection there to, you know, so probably if anybody would be him. I was wondering about that. If you had dogs, did, did your feeling for them come through in the story? Uh, it does. You know, you know, there's, and I don't, I'm not going to mention that because it tells too much about the end of the story. There's a, <laughs> true, there's a reflection <laughs> of what happened in my life that relates to what happens to Graylin and company in the book. And uh, once I'm, you know, on book tour, I'll talk more about that, but uh there's a reason a certain event occurs at the end of the novel that relates to something that happened in my life with one of my dogs. So, and and I know there are moments throughout that Nix deals with that. I could see somebody looking at, you know, a close dog family member in, in similar ways. Um, (laughs) uh, Exactly. Avoid telling something horrible that happened at the end. So, and who was, who was your favorite character? Maybe not the one that you related to the most, but the one that you had the most fun with. Um, I think the one I had the most, well, it's different. I mean, every character I like writing. I mean, uh, I like, you know, Kant because he's, he doesn't take things too seriously. You know, he's got definitely a, a, a darker sort of a wounded part of his personality. But at the same time, you know, he's the little bit of the comic relief to the story. You know, he uh, says things that most people wouldn't say out loud. Um, you know, I always you can get away with that. it. He can get away with it. He's a prince. So, you know, he's used to being able to say things and not have been held accountable. So he's fun to write, you know, Nix, uh, and that's who I grew up telling the story. The, this story would not exist without her. So there's a, a bond to her, you know, her wound, uh, you know, where she's headed, you know, you know, I'm almost on the second book. So I know that, you know, it's a very hard second book for her. So uh, there's a lot of pathos involved with her that I, that I can relate to. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing I like about being an ensemble cast is that, 
you know, you get to tap into so many different uh, personalities and that each one is, is unique. So you get a different experience. You know, if, I, if the uh, entire story was written from Nick's point of view, I don't think I'd enjoy writing the story as much. You know, I could probably, you know, describe, uh, uh, you know, Rafe and Kemp and everybody else that surrounds her, Graylin, uh, well enough just through her POV, but it wouldn't be as fun as writing scenes, you know, when, you, when I get to put myself in the boots of the other characters. Were there any characters that were really difficult for you to write? Um, you know, probably for different reasons, different characters. Each of them have some, some prickly sparks that I, that I have difficulty with. Um, but then I enjoy that. I like that as a challenge as a writer. Um, you know, probably the one I, I have probably a little bit of difficulty uh, writing. Again, even though I, I say Graylin is, is my personality and the one I feel closest with, is that everybody else has, uh, is, is uh, younger and you know he's the one that's carrying the weight of, of horrible things that have happened in the past and you know trying to to, to carry on that gravitas is, is, is a bit difficult to carry off especially when i'm jumping like right out of Kant's personality who's but you know you know frothier and lighter and 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 doesn't take things too seriously then getting into the, the grimness of uh, grail and sometimes it takes me a day or two to to get up to speed to be in that pov mm. How did you uh, figure out when the times to switch POV were and like where, where those fit? It doesn't, again, it's, it just feels sort of natural to the story when, I, when it needs to change point of view. Um, sometimes I'm wrong. I think I'm ready to switch a point, point of view, but then I'll go back and oh, this is, I'm either starting this too soon or starting this too late. So I'll have to, you know, configure and, and jigger that around a little bit until it fits better. So it's, I can't say that it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of uh, both calculation and instinct when it comes to figuring out when to change those point of view. Because it seems like it would be much easier when the ensemble is together or, or when you know that you need to see something from a certain point of view, but when they're all apart, the timing of it lines up so perfectly. It, it's almost like a puzzle. We, we see something happen to Nick's from her point of view and then later you hear people talking about it from a much different part of the world. Yeah, I mean that was a bit of a juggling act to make sure that uh, I, I don't. I always don't like. I don't like to write stories where when you switch to another character's point of view, you go back in time. Right. I like. I like it so that when you're jumping to another point of view, the same span of time has passed for all the characters, so that the story's always sort of moving forward. You're not suddenly having to go back in time, and that can confuse the reader, uh, thinking that something's happening in a linear fashion when it's not. Um, right. So, you know, time for most people moves, it, you know, forward all the time. So I think when you're reading, you expect the, the same thing to happen in the story. And when it doesn't, it can throw the reader out of the story. So I'd like to try to keep it as linear as I can. And then you have to keep thinking like, okay, wait, this was before this happened. Like, as a reader, you have to start doing math. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge because it requires sometimes to slow down the story and have a moment of, of exposition where you have to sort of catch the reader up a little bit about, you know, where you are in this storyline in reference to everybody else. Um, so it's a, and then not making that too arduous or boring. Um, so it's a bit of, a bit of a challenge to, to try to carry that off well. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, the, I, I want to talk a little bit about the world building, uh, sure. which did you, so I guess because you were saying that you had sticky notes everywhere and notes and ideas every now and then, uh, Very messy. was world building something that you worked on kind of on its own and then fit the story into it? Or was it something that you were building upon as you, you had the story in mind and as you were telling the story, you learned more and more about the world yourself? Well, definitely I had the idea for the tidally locked planet from the get-go. And then it became a matter of, you know, what would that landscape look like? And then it began, you know, how would people survive in that landscape? And if they did survive, you know, what type of civilizations might arise over time in these, in these various areas? Uh, what type of conflicts might arise in that area? And then putting the overarching uh, apocalyptic event that's about to occur, you know, how does that become apparent to the world at large? Um, you know, so Nix has a prophetic vision, even though it sounds like it's magic, there's a scientific basis that over time will become clear, which is actually a challenge to write. It's hard to 
being that fantasy landscape and try to explain science. Uh, but over time, you're gonna find out that her visions aren't necessarily just pure magic. There's a, there's a scientific basis why she has this vision. Interesting. Obviously, Pharrell, the alchemist, uh, uses his, uh, his uh, telescopes to, to recognize that the face of the moon has been slowly, incrementally over a century growing larger, which makes him think that the moon is gonna crash. So uh, then it became, you know, who's gonna tell the story best? You know, is, you know, do we start with uh, uh, one character? Do we do an ensemble? So it's, then, then, then it, you be, begin to sort of piece everything. I like I said, mentioned like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, but basically it becomes the setting, Tyler Lock Planet, the conflict, you know, what's the, the big overarching threat to this world? Cast of characters that are, that, you know, are planted and, and, and grow in the different environments that they, that, that I, that I've created. And then trying to find a way of, of putting that cast together that there's threads that could connect a, a, you know, a team together, a fellowship for lack of a better term to, to, to bring them together that makes sense. And so because it's a fantasy novel, there's this, you know, great big map in the front of the book, which is beautiful. And, and always one of the best parts of picking up a fantasy book. Um, uh, Soraya Corcoran provided the map drawing. I hope I'm pronouncing that yes. right. Um, yeah. What was speaking with her about the world like, especially because this is not a map that we would find in the real world. Is she somebody that specializes in fantasy type maps, I suppose, cartography? Well, uh, you know, I, I owe her a big, uh, you know, a big thank you and debt because this probably, this story wouldn't exist if she wasn't a map maker. Mm. And how that came about is that there is uh, one of my other fantasy series, the God Slayer series, uh, has some rudimentary maps. They're, they're, they're maps, but I was never really that satisfied with the maps. And apparently, either was uh, Mahir Wanchu. He's a, uh, a fantasy book critic who uh, I've been friends with since back when I was writing fantasy decades ago. And he asked, "Hey Jim, you know, would you mind? I have a friend who's a map maker who would love to do, you know, a more, you know, beautiful rendition of your maps from the God Slayer series." And would you mind if I commissioned her to do that? I said, sure, you know, go ahead. And uh, months go by and Mahir showed me the finished product, the story I did of, uh, of that world's maps. And they were so stunning that I thought I want her to do this map that I had tucked away and been scribbled and scrawled on for, you know, years. It's a yellowed, wrinkled thing. So I tried to produce a slightly cleaner version of that. I said, you know, would you mind, you know, recreating this map? And she did. So I haven't even started writing this book. Hadn't even oh, wow. you know, talked to my publisher, any publishers about it. I just thought, I just want to see what she could do with that. And the result was so beautiful. I thought, you know, I'm going to write this freaking story. So Mahir and, and Soria were the ones that gave me that nudge basically to go from this, this slowly, you know, snowball rolling down a hill type of, of story that was building in my idea boxes into write the damn thing. So, uh, so yeah, so I owe her a big, but yeah, so she, there's a, you know, on my website, my social media, so you can find a, a link and, and also on the website, a link to, to her work. And she specializes in, in doing cartography and in doing maps, both for fantasy landscapes and for real landscapes. And she oh, has okay. beautiful, I mean, she's just stunning things that she's done. Did you have any conversations with her about uh, things that make sense geographically? Oh yeah, I mean, she was, again, what I love about her too, similar to Denea, is that, you know, she would go, well, you know, this, you know, the way you've structured this landscape, you know, what if we added a river that did this? Cause you know, it seems like the way that, you know, if those weather patterns are moving through here, this would seem like would be the, what would happen. So she also contributed greatly to, to tweaking that idea of what this lands would look like based upon just her own history of, of doing countless maps over the years. Mm -hmm. So she was definitely vital in, in that, uh, in tweaking those maps. And it seems like something that if you're not a geographer to some extent, then there's no way for you to know that limestone panels wouldn't be on this type of landscape or right. a city couldn't be this close to a volcano. I, I don't know. Um, that's she that's was, fascinating to me. I, well, she gave you know, some great, great ideas behind uh, some of the details of that land. And uh, since you're coming from the Sigma series and uh, it seems like she was kind of your push into this, did, uh, did you have any trouble shifting genres? I've heard other authors have, you know, have 
tried doing the multiple genre thing and kind of ran into trouble just because they their publisher didn't want them to or they couldn't um, their agents didn't think that they'd find the same audience or that sort of thing. So, so what was it like? I suppose the shift back to fantasy. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to my to my publishers uh, over the years. I've it began. It goes back to the background. I read so much that I like to write so much. It's hard for me. I get, and once an idea gets stuck in my head, it's hard for me to let it go unless I write it. So over the years, you know, I've I've done basically two books every year since the beginning of my career. And it's always been basically like a Rollins thriller, you just Sigma Force novel every year, and then something else. And that something else gives me a chance to do something, stretch my literary legs a little bit, uh, do something that, that makes me feel fresher. Because I think if I did a staccato paced thriller or like a Sigma Force thriller, Sigma Force thriller, Sigma Force thriller, you know, right after each other, I'm afraid I would get a, you might, that reader might begin to sense he's getting a little bored with these characters. What allows me to, to, to hopefully, feel fresh when I return to a Sigma novel is that I've gone somewhere else, that I'm ready to return to those characters. I'm excited to return to those characters. Because I've missed them. So hopefully some of that sentiment ends up on the page. And so it will make the Sigma novel feel like, you know, that Jim's excited about it. Therefore, I should be excited about it. And so, uh, you know, over the years, you know, I've done a, a middle school series. I've done a, sort of a, a gothic vampiric type of series. Uh, as my offshoot, I've done the fantasy novels that I were alternating with early in my career. I did the novelization to the, uh, to the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the, the Indiana Jones uh, last movie. Uh, so it's always fun doing something different. You know, I, I like to, to challenge myself to, to, to try to see what I can do and what I can't do. And uh, like for the doing the vampiric uh, gothic novel, I... I had this idea for this, this vampiric series that was going to you know, put vampires within the Catholic church. And uh, so it took me a while to build that world out in my head. And, and I, I tried writing it by myself and I realized, you know, it's just not my wheelhouse. I'm, I, I can't quite capture that, that wow. Gothic historical thing and, and match it to a fast paced thriller. So uh, I had been re uh, Rebecca Cantrell who co-wrote that series with me. She, um, I've known her since before she was published. She took a writer's retreat where I was teaching. Uh, I already knew she was going to be spectacular because her work was was uh, fantastic. I gave her a blurb for her first uh, first of her mystery novels. But I was reading one of her novels and it, and she, her ability to create sense of place and time with an economy of words is really was really impressive. Uh, she can evoke you know strong things with just a few words. I thought you know, this is just what she's doing is what this what this series needs. So I called her and said, hey, Rebecca, you know, I've got this idea for a series and you know, I think you would be great. You know, I could, I could bring, you know, what I can bring to the table, the you know, weird creatures, action, adventure, uh, but I need sort of gothic, rich, historical, uh, you know, feel to the novel. And, and, and I just, I'm not pulling it off well, but I, I, you know, I think you could do that. And she said, what's it about? And I said, it's about vampires. She goes, no, <laughs> no, I'm not writing a vampire novel. I said, well, wait, let me just tell you, it's more historical than that, you know, it's much richer. So I, I laid out the history and she goes, you know, that is actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I'll how do that. could you say no to vampires? I don't. Uh... So, so again, you know, I, I always like doing something different, like, you know, the Sigma Force novel that's coming out in April, that's, you know, put to bed and, yeah, and but I already have my research and my notes and my outline for the next one. So uh, it's, it's nice to be able to alternate between doing that staccato paced thriller and then doing something else, whether it's just the world building of a fantasy or channeling myself as a writer to do something gothic in nature. Um, so that when I return to the Sigma Forest universe, uh, I'm coming to it with, you know, with excitement and, and ready to return and, and mm -hmm. you know, anxious to, to see what this character has been up to. Yeah. Now, um, you've dedicated this novel to Terry Brooks. Uh, yes. And I learned that Terry Brooks was one of the judges for your, for your first book. You sent it to a contest for the Maui Writers Retreat. Is that right? That is totally right. Um, you know, I went I went to that to the Maui Writers. It was my first writers conference, and uh, uh, really, I was un, unpublished. I tried writing some short fiction that's now buried in my backyard. Hopefully, never see the light of day. <laughs> uh, I wrote my first novel, Subterranean, was uh, got, you know, was was fielding rejection after rejection. I was rejected by 49 different agents before the 50th agent saw something and agreed to represent that. And uh, she asked me what all agents always going to ask you when they when they maybe 
interested in, in representing you. She said, you know, what are you working on now? And I had been working on the first of a fantasy series. So I was having no luck selling subterranean, the sort of a deep earth adventure thriller. So I thought, well, maybe I'm not a thriller writer. Maybe I'm going to be a fantasy writer. So I had been working on this fantasy novel. So I was explaining it to her. She goes, no, stop, 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 stop. Don't like fantasy. Don't nobody, don't know any of the fantasy editors or publishers, you know, stop writing that. Give me another thriller. And me being the unpublished author, afraid of losing this agent, I said, yes, of course. I will stop writing this fantasy and I will switch over to a thriller, which was a lie because I was almost done that fantasy. There's no way once you reach a certain point in a story that an author cannot finish that story. And I had already submitted part of that story to that contest at the beginning of summer. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to give myself the rest of summer because clearly I've got 49 different rejections for subterranean. This agent's never going to be able to sell this anyways. I'm not giving up on this fantasy. So end of summer rolls around, uh, this is sort of a meet and greet uh, tea for authors and participants at this conference. And it's a big conference. There's like 600 attendees. And so it's a very crowded ballroom. And, and I look across the room and I, I see Mr. Brooks and I did the typical fanboy genuflection in front of Mr. Brooks saying how much I loved his books and that it was so influential. And he looks at my name tag and goes, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours too. And I didn't know what he meant at that point because I didn't know he was one of the judges, but he admitted he was uh -huh. one of the judges. I really liked your story. And my editor is here from Del Rey and he would like to speak to you. So based upon that personal introduction, I ended up with a three book fantasy offer. So of course wow. I promptly called my agent and said, hey, I think I sold my fantasy series. Would you want to you know, represent it and you know, do the contracts? He says, sure, I love fantasy. Uh, so it's just, by the way, I also have two publishers bidding right now for Subterranean. So, that was a very strange week. So she basically went from unpublished to suddenly being published by under two different genres, under two different publishers. Hence, we had the, 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 the pen name situation is that they're so different, such different genres, we better create different pen names. Oh, for right, yeah. Since they were going to deb debut in close to each other. So uh, anyway, that's how that happened. Wow, that sounds like a huge shift. Um, so did, did you end up knowing Terry Brooks personally over time after that? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I can't say that we're, we're, we're intimate friends, but yeah, Terry's been great. He's been very supportive of my career. You know, we've done lunches and dinners and and uh, so, yeah, he's a great guy. You know, besides being a great author, he's a great guy. He's been very supportive to authors over the years. Uh, he doesn't get enough credit for how much he's helped other authors, not just me, and you get their foothold in this industry. I, that's what it sounded like, just from the dedication alone. like how much he has an influence on other people's careers and on their lives without even really recognizing what he's done, let alone for what he's done for the fantasy world. Yeah, I mean, he's very humble. He's, uh, you know, sometimes you run to authors that are a little full of themselves. I shall not name names. <laughs> but <laughs> Terry has the right to be that way. And he's not. He's funny. He's humorous. He's humble. Uh, and... Uh, again, very supportive to, you know, other authors that are trying to get their feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have just a few last questions. One of them being, did you, were you a part of the narration for the audiobook? Very incrementally. Uh, okay, I, I okay. did a, a 10 minute um, introduction to the series uh, that I recorded for the audio edition. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of uh, before the story starts, you're going to hear me explain, you know, why, why I'm telling the story, you know, why a, a writer known as a scientific thriller writer is jumping into fantasy and you know, where the genesis of the story came from. Just some, some little background before this, the actual, and, and the, the narrator is, is awesome for this book. Uh, Nicola Barber is the, yes. the narrator. Yes, I mention that. Um, have you listened so, to the audiobook? I, I She sent me, um, or rather the, the audio publisher sent me, uh, probably about maybe the first 10 minutes that she's done. Okay. Uh, they, and they're, they're, I'm not sure what they do, but they're constructing. And the we're, right yeah, now. we're recording this very early. So I'm sure that it's going to take a while for them to completely finish it and get it ready to be sent out. But um, yeah, so yeah, it sounds fantastic. With the, uh, with the rise of audiobooks, have you started reading your books out loud to make sure that they sound like they can be spoken? I don't. And, and the reason why is that I'm a horrible, I mean, 
I was sweating bullets just to do that 10 minute narration. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, it's like a personal, it's, a, it's one of the nine circles of hell for me to have to uh, <laughs> do that. And, you know, I occasionally, you know, book events will ask me to do readings and I will twist myself into a knot not to do a reading. Um, you know, I always tell people, unless you can do funny voices, you shouldn't be do, reading your own stuff. Uh, so, you know, what, the only time I have a tendency to read out loud is dialogue is I, I, I want to make sure that sounds natural to the ear. So I will, I will read my dialogue out loud, but generally the, uh, the rest of it, I won't, won't read out loud. It's, it's so funny. Every author has a different thing to say about that. S some authors are like, oh, I start by speaking the book and then I type it later. Like, so interesting. Um, so what's next for you? Uh, so next coming out in April is uh, King Kingdom of Bones. It's the, the next Sigma Force novel. I'm working on... Uh, just about finished the second book in this in this series. Um, we have a working title. I don't know if she should announce that because I don't know if that's going to be the final title. Uh, that's all right. So probably another month or so we'll we'll actually have the official second book title. So keep uh, an eye out. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, that's basically what's going on in in after this. A lot of snow shoveling. So, yeah. <laughs> right. um, great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, to awesome. our viewers. It. <laughs> to our viewers. Thank you for listening. Look out for us next time on Book Reporter Talks 2.